thank you all for joining us this evening. I think people will probably continue to trickle in as we get started here, but we have a very packed evening full of lots of exciting things to offer to you tonight. So um, let's get started. My name is Stephen Bridges. I am the Senior Curator and Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum at Michigan State University. And I have the pleasure of being uh, the host this evening for this wonderful program. So tonight uh, we will be featuring uh, several uh, esteemed invited guests. I'm very excited about this program. I know that I say that about every program that we do, but I am really, really excited about this one. This is gonna be really, truly unique uh, program this evening. Um, and again, so happy to have you all here with us. The program tonight, Songs from the Deep, takes place in conjunction with the exhibition currently on view at the MSU Broad, uh, Jenny Kendler, The Long Goodbye. And of course, we're very happy to have Jenny Kendler here with us this evening, as well as one of her collaborators, Andrew Bernat, who are gonna be talking quite a bit about their project, Whale Bells. And Whale Bells as an installation, as well as a sonic uh, kind of uh, interactive work of art is the kind of basis and focus uh, for, this, for this program this evening upon which we will continue to build as the evening goes on. Uh, in response to the Whale Bells project, we have uh, musicians and composers Lynn Goringer and David Rothenberg also joining us and we have not one but two premier musical composition performance, performances events tonight to share with you um, as we progress through the evening. So um, quickly I would like to thank the Michigan State University Federal Credit Union for the support of the Artist Project Series uh, which Jenny's exhibition is a part of as well as their support for the program this evening. Uh, we'll start uh, by introducing Jenny and Andrew, who will take us through the Whale Bells project, um, followed by performances by Lynn and by David, and that will be followed by a moderated conversation between our invited guests, um, and then capped off with uh, questions and answers with the audience, with you. So in the meantime, until we reach that end portion, please, um, if you don't mind, uh, stay muted throughout the program. Um, you can have your cameras on, cameras off as you wish. It's always nice to see you, um, but do note that this program this evening is being recorded. And there's also the, uh, for those that may wish or, or otherwise um, would like it, there is live captioning available for this program. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a live caption button that you are uh, welcome to turn on. So as we um, get started here, I'd first like to just take a moment to acknowledge that, you know, as we're coming together from different locations in this shared virtual space, it's perhaps all the more important to acknowledge that the exhibition Jenny Kendler, The Long Goodbye is cited at the MSU Broad Art Museum, which itself is situated on the ancestral, traditional and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa and Potawatomi peoples. The museum and Michigan State University reside on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. This statement is an acknowledgement of the ongoing and systemic erasure of indigenous people perpetuated by the US state. As we open this program, I invite you all to consider what histories have brought you to the space you currently inhabit or occupy and how these histories may also come to bear on considerations of art, scientific inquiry, and the protection of land, water, and the great diversity of life on earth. Without further ado, now I will turn to introduce Jenny Kendler and Andrew Bernat. Jenny Kendler is an interdisciplinary artist, naturalist, and environmental activist whose work asks, asks us to decenter the human, making space for the transformative otherness of our biodiverse Earth. Over the last 15 years, her artwork centered on the climate, excuse me, her artwork centered on the climate crisis and biodiversity loss have been shown nationally and internationally, including at Storm King, the MCA Chicago, the Albright Knox, the California Academy of Sciences, the Chicago Biennial, and the Kochi Mazuris Biennale. She has also created public art projects for locations from urban conservatories to remote deserts to tropical forests. Since 2014, Jenny has been the first artist in residence with the environmental nonprofit uh, Natural Resource Defense Council and is currently working with them to develop a public art project for New York City's Governor's Island in 2022. She is an organizer for Art World, De art World Decarbonization through Artists Commit 
and has been a direct action organizer for Extinction Rebellion Chicago. She is board co-chair of Artist Residency Acre and is the first artist to be invited onto the board of International Climate Change Organization 350.org. In addition to her solar project at the MSU Broad Museum, her work is currently on view at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, the CCA Wattis Institute for Contemporary Art in San Francisco, the Dom Museum in Vienna, and she is currently working on an intersectional memorial titled Mending Wall for the Chicago Park District at the Field, oh, excuse me, and the Field Museum. And now Andrew. Andrew Bernat is an artist and self-described self materialist. He thinks with and through the substance of things. Informed by a background in material science and glass blowing, Bernat explores moments of queer phenomenology in the everyday. He is interested broadly in technologies of making and specifically in craftsmanship as a practice of both encoding and producing knowledge. Bernat is based in Chicago where he completed his MFA at the University of Chicago. Additionally, he holds dual undergraduate degrees from Brown University and the Rhode Island School of Design and was a Fulbright Fellow in Sweden. And with that, I hope everyone will join me in welcoming Jenny and Andrew. Thank you so much, Stephen. <laughs> Um, I think that if we're ready, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We're going to talk a little bit about the um, Whale Bells project itself, which is the sort of nexus around which all of the um, other elements of this presentation are going to be swirling. Give me just a moment. Um, so, uh, so whale bells is um, not only, as you all know, at this point, um, thanks to Stephen's introduction, um, which also thank you for that gracious introduction, and thank you to the museum for hosting us. Um, whale bells is not only a sculptural installation of uh, twenty-five glass bells, but it also is an instrument. Um, it arose from a initial collaboration between Andrew and I when we were invited to propose something for a National Geographic. Um, Arctic icebreaker ship. Uh, the prompt was to have something that had a relationship to Arctic ecosystems and species and threats to the region where we know the experience um, of climate change is significantly more exacerbated than in temperate regions. Um, what you're looking at here and what we ended up creating for the ship is a series of hand-blown glass bells that enclose a tympanic boule or an ear bone fossil from a Miocene epoch whale. Um, this bone, of course, once helped the whale to perceive sound, and in the bells, the part of the ear that once perceived sound now creates sound. In the case of uh, the exhibition on the ship, the bells are rung not by human hands, as you will see during Lynn's beautiful and moving performance, but they were rung by the rocking of the Arctic Ocean itself. So we wanted our bells to both visually and conceptually reference uh, whales. Traditionally, bells are cast in metal and have a flared lip. Our blown glass bells, as you saw, have a streamlined geometry that references the shape of a spy hopping whale. Spy hopping is a surfacing behavior in which a whale rises and holds a vertical position partially out of the water. This gesture is an arresting sculptural posture in which the horizontal plane between air and water is breached. Our blown glass bells are tinted with subtle gradients of transparent color. Shades of cool and warm grays shift as you observe them from different angles. Uh, and these images showing several bells backlit by diffused daylight reveal the hints of purple, blue, and green that emerge within the faint um, the, the fade from almost clear to dark gray. Now we have a little video to show you. Uh, and this video overviews the process of blowing a glass bell. Thought that would be fun to see. I know that's glass blowing is not something maybe everyone sees every day. So I thought it would be useful to have to a uh, point of reference. Um, so here, Clear molten glass is gathered on a hollow steel tube called a blowpipe. A small amount of intensely colored glass is applied and then layered 
over with additional clear glass. Air is introduced into the mass of glass through the blowpipe. Um, glass blowing often <laughs> requires teamwork. So here I'm assisted by Charlie Mannion, who you just saw. And I use this process of inflating the bubble to stretch the color layer to create a gradient. Um, this is really unusual to the material of glass, this way of creating this um, translucent gradient. Uh, the form is shaped with wet newspaper and hand tools. A constriction is made in the bubble, which is then broken off, which you just saw, and then transferred to another steel rod, rod called the pontal. Here, that broken aperture is heated, uh, opened, and shaped into the final bell shape. So here I'm using wooden sticks to dilate the aperture of the bell. When the glass is hot, it glows in shades of red and orange. But when it cools, the object's true color is revealed. And I think just generally glass blowing uh, is a mesmerizing process. Um, and there's this complex interplay between rotation, gravity, and breath that I think has resonances more largely within this sculpture. Um, it was a really, um, yes, mesmerizing process to watch Andrew blow that glass. And I can't say that there was, you know, wasn't a part of me that um, in initially when we were conceiving this project, that was a big motivation for me to be able to see and understand that process more fully. Um, Uh, just picking up on that idea of the gradient of color, which I think has, as I said, many uh, conceptual resonances within our artwork. One point of reference um, is the depth of the ocean itself and the qualities of darkness and pressure as one descends through this inconceivably vast volume of liquid um, to this depth where light, light doesn't penetrate. Yeah, and of course, um, whales have developed their own special ways of navigating and communicating within that um, depth and darkness. I think that that's something that, of course, has become so compelling to us, not only in what we're interested in in this project, but to humans in general with whales is this like the sort of un unknownness of this region that they inhabit. Um, I believe I've heard that the, you know, the surface of the, the um, you know, under a surface of the deep ocean is less well known than the surface of the moon. So it truly is um, an unexplored region, um, not whales, however. So, you know, humpback whales are known for their haunting songs. This diagram is actually of a beaked whale, um, but I liked it because you can see in blue the tympanic or auditory bulla. So you can kind of understand the positionality of the fossil that we are using as the clapper in the whale bells. Humpbacks, of course, are known for their haunting songs, which are a form of rich communication born of what we might refer to as an alien acoustic culture, it's as yet unintelligible to us humans. When in the 1985, the moratorium on commercial whaling was finally enacted, only 5% of humpback whales remained. Um, Though populations have since been recovering, less well-known threats continue, which is including the significant impact of commercial shipping noise, fossil fuel seismic exploration, and military sonar, which can not only prevent whales from finding food, from finding mates, but actually, especially in the case of military sonar and oil and gas um, explosive devices actually can kill whales. So humpbacks' unique sonic cultures and the future survival of their species are jeopardized by this acoustic pollution of our oceans. Here you can see more closely the tympanic bulla. These, of course, also were sourced from um, these Miocene whales are a work whale, whale, so they're an ancestor of modern humpbacks. Um, when these whales swam in the seas five to 20 million years ago, they were amongst the most culturally sophisticated beings on Earth Long before Homo sapiens were first inspired to sing by the speech of birds, these long-lived beings possessed a rich mode of communication. Whether we discover that it may be musical, semantic, or some other mode of communication, 
that we don't yet understand. It may hopefully be discovered in our lifetimes. And I love this drawing because it so beautifully illustrates the biodiversity of our planet sort of heading, spiraling back into deep time. And we like to think of this piece as a kind of oceanic palimpsest or a collaborative music created across deep time, perhaps a message from these ancient whales to today's endangered whales. And as Jenny mentioned at the beginning, one can think of this piece, Whale Bells, both as a sculpture and as an instrument. Um, and I thought it would be useful to point to the, the sort of traditional understanding of an instrument uh, composed of many bells, uh, which is referred to as a carillon. So this is the Rockefeller Memorial Chapel carillon at the University of Chicago, which I hear every day from my home in Chicago. Um, I was just gonna point out uh, <laughs> that they say on their website that this carillon composed of 72 bells and 100 tons of bronze is the single largest musical instrument ever built. I don't know if that's accurate, but I love that, I that idea. This second image is of a different, smaller carill carillon, but just pointing to this um, connection between the bells that you see on the left and the sort of keyboard on the right composed of these wooden levers by a system of cables. So in this format, the musician or caroliner actuates a percussive clapper inside the bell by depressing the lever. And you'll see in our um, carillon, there's a more um, direct activation. And Lynn really expanded those potential uh, forms of activation um, in her work. Uh, another bell reference for us is the ship's bell, which is used for signaling time based on an eight bell system. Uh, so on the top image there is just a reference is the uh, Titanic spell. Um, and then in the, the table below, you see the ringing pattern used to indicate different times of day and corresponding watches, which is ship lingo for like a work shift. Um, so eight bells signals the end watch as in eight bells and all's well. And a deceased sailor is honored by the sounding of the eight bells. Uh, and this funerary tradition has deep resonance within our artwork. Uh, we used rope and a variety of knots, whipping and netting techniques in order to hang our bells and to protect, sort of insulate um, the whale ear bone fossil from directly striking the glass and <laughs> breaking it. Um, and we were inspired by the tradition of suspending glass buoys within rope netting um, and consulted my favorite resource for rope, rope craft, the Ashley Book of Knots, subtitled every practical knot, what it looks like, who uses it, where it comes from, and how to tie it. And special thanks to Lily Homer for her assistance with this aspect of the work. And so now you finally get to see the finished piece hanging in the gallery as part of um, my exhibition, The Long Goodbye at the MSU Broad. Um, uh, so, you can see more about the other works um, at, that are part of the show, which of course we don't have time to get into right now on my website, which is jennykendler.com or hopefully by visiting the MSU through June 27th. I wanted to take this moment to think about a little bit of historical and political context. Of course, um, the environmental movement started in many ways with the Save the Whales movement in the 70s, which also coincided with Earth Day and the first Endangered Species Act, Clean Air and Water Acts, which at that time, of course, were widely supported, completely bipartisan bills passed under Nixon. So we're in a very different moment um, and also a moment of ecological crisis where we really have a, a handful of years to act not only on climate change, but um, on the biodiversity crisis where we know that up to 1 million species may be threatened with extinction, especially due to climate change, but also due to other land and in this case, ocean use um, by human beings. The power that whales hold over us remains. And so we, I think wanna see this work as a clarion call to see the whales, not just as symbols for human longing, but really as themselves um, I wanted to read a short quote from Henry Beston's uh, memoir, The Outermost House, that I think really um, helps to sum this up. 
we need another and a wiser and perhaps more mystical concept of animals. I want to say non-human animals, because of course we are animals. Remote from universal nature and living by complicated artifice, humans and civilization survey the creature through the glass of their knowledge and see thereby a feather magnified and the whole image in distortion. We patronize them for their incompleteness, for the tragic fate of having taken form so far below ourselves, and therein do we err. For the animal sh shall not be measured by man. In a world older and more complicated than ours, they move finished and complete, gifted with the extension of the senses we have lost or never attained, living by voices we shall never hear. They are not brethren. They are not underlings. They are other nations caught with ourselves in the net of life and time, fellow prisoners of the splendor and travail of the earth. And so um, I really wanted to thank the museum, especially for the, op the ability to um, bring this piece to life in a way that I think I could only begin to imagine when Andrew and I first conceived of it. Uh, to actually be played and engaged with as a musical instrument by a composer. Um, and I'm so deeply pleased to uh, segue over to the marvelous Lynn Goringer and um, allow her to share with you the composition that she created for our sculptural work. Hey, Katie, you can stop my screen share now, please. Where I can. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny and Andrew. Um, really quick, uh, I have the pleasure um, of introducing Lynn as well. And uh, I perhaps was not entirely clear uh, in my introduction, but um, we're grateful to Lynn. Lynn, at some point, my colleague Katie Grulick, who's also here on the, on the meeting or on the program this evening, um, reached out to Lynn and invited her to. Um, create a musical composition from the whale bells. And I look forward to, to hearing from Lynn a little bit later about um, her, her initial response to the invitation and kind of also perhaps what, what opportunities she saw in, in that invitation. But we are thrilled that she accepted that invitation and we very much look forward to sharing with you in a moment uh, the composition and video, perform or video documentation of the performance um, uh, that took place uh, just earlier this week, in fact. But before we get there, quick, let me read Lynn's bio and introduce her properly. Lynn Goringer's research focuses on video, visual media, and sound-based interactive approaches to public space and site-specific art practices with a particular focus on the experience of the body and space. At the center of this research are questions about how we as individuals create and navigate space and the ways in which larger government infrastructures influence how we navigate public and private spheres. These questions drive her artistic practice and have led her to work within a variety of media, including video, body-centered cybernetic performance art that explores notions of privacy, wearable controllers, audio walks, and public sound art. Her current body of work explores the mythopoetic unseen using histories of rebellion and magic to inform her practice. In addition to creative projects and video production, Goringer's writings focus primarily on the relationship of bodies on their power and how bodies of power influence our daily lives. Currently, she's an assistant professor of composition at Michigan State University, where she teaches courses in electronic music, visually mediated performance, improvisation, and experimental film. She received her doctorate from Brown University in 2011 and a master in fine arts from Bard College in 2015. And it looks like you have a friend joining you, Lynn. Uh, thank you for being here this evening. And thank you so much. Yeah, I have this little little friend. He's gonna he's gonna fuzz in and out for a while here. Um, it's really great. This piece has been really fun to work on, and I'm so grateful to uh, Katie Garlick for inviting me to do this, and for Jenny Kindler and Andrew Bernat to um, allow me to play this wonderful set of bells. Uh, so a little bit about the piece before we uh, listen to it. Uh, this is a um, this is a piece that is set up in 12 sections. There's two performers. There's myself and a composer performer, Tra uh, Trevor Smith has also joined me in this, in this uh, recording of this. And in this piece, in these 12 sections, uh, we're, we're really think, or I'm really thinking about these notions of time and space and uh, 
the ideas of actually like what it means to keep time, uh, both oceanic time and like the 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 more um, geologic scale uh, that we were looking at uh, a little bit ago, and also within the day to day life of time scales on oceans and and even in just in our personal lives. Um, and these these uh, sections are demarcated by uh, bell rings that are counting off uh, each section. Um, and the other aspect of this is that I would uh, this follows within a tradition for me of art, uh, very privileged composers who get to work with the art of other uh, artists. Um, and with that, I'm thinking about the work of sort of David Tudor uh, and uh, David, Ro David Rothenberg and some of these other amazing, sorry, not David Rothenberg. I'm so sorry. I just looked up there. Uh, David Tudor <laughs> and uh, my, my, anyway, I have a little bit of a Zoom fog here, but there's this long tradition of artists working with composers to create wonderful site-specific pieces. And uh, it was a really pleasure to work on this piece uh, with the Broad. And uh, so I think I'm happy to answer questions after. Thank you so much. Let's we can hear that now.
That was the way to do it. Oh, that was amazing, Lynn. So much to say. Thank you so much. Um, I, I also want to note that um, the museum has recently acquired eight of the bells uh, from Jenny and Andrew. Um, and we're very happy to have those come into the collection. And additionally, to have uh, Lynn's work, uh, also the score that was created, which I believe was was visible there in the, in the piece. Is that right, Lynn? Um, accompany those whale bells into the museum's collection and, and remain for posterity. Um, so yes, very excited that. And thank you again, Lynn, for this. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. And the score is, the score is made so we can work on any set of uh, any set of these bells. So for sure. Thank you. I'm so excited to have it be a part of the collection. Fantastic. Okay. Now I have the great honor of introducing David Rothenberg. And David's bio is going to give me a little bit of a tongue twister, I think, but I'm going to give my best. Forgive me if I pronounce any names wrong. David Rothenberg makes music live with the sounds of nature, records music with other species, and writes books and makes films about the process. He has performed and recorded with Pauline Oliveros, Peter Gabriel, Ray Fieri, Suzanne Vega, Scanner, Elliot Sharp, Iva Bitova, and the Karnataka College of Percussion. <laughs> His CD, One Dark Night, I Left My Silent House, a duet with pianist Marilyn Crispell on ECM was called Un Petit Miracle, I don't speak French, sorry, Un Petit Miracle uh, by Le Monde and named by The Village Voice, one of the 10 best CDs of 2010. Rothenberg has more than 30 other recordings on numerous labels, including Grun Recorda, Claremont, and Oslo Sessions recordings. His latest releases include In the Wake of Memories with Berlin percussionist Volker Lankau and Syrian refugee Oud Master Basim Mukdad. And They Say Humans Exist with guitarist Jacob Young and percussionist Siddiqui Kamara named Best Jazz Album of 2020 by Stereo Plus Magazine. His books and recordings in the field of interspecies music include Why Birds Sing on Birds, Thousand Mile Song on Whales, Bug Music on Insects, and Nightingales in Berlin on one very special species of bird and the humans who make music with them. These works have been translated into many foreign languages and have been the subject of documentary films and radio programs in many countries, including Germany, France, Finland, Norway, Denmark, the UK, and the United States, including the BBC feature-length TV program, Why Birds Sing, and the independent documentary, Nightingales in Berlin. Rothenberg is Distinguished Professor of Philosophy and Music at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Thank you, David, for being here this evening. Thanks, Stephen, for reading all that. <laughs> and, uh, okay, we are now gonna learn how to play music with a whale. Can you see this? Can you hear me? This is how it's done. Yes, you can play music live with whales, even playing something like a clarinet. People still don't think we actually did this, so I'll just show you this little film of how we did this a few years ago in Hawaii. We're going out to meet the whales and make some music with them. Come on. Mm-hmm. 
Yes. What are these whales actually up to? And why didn't we know about this for thousands of years? You had to have underwater listening devices to really hear these sounds. And in the 1950s, the American Navy, desperate to hear what the Russians were doing secretly underwater with their submarines, they just put these hydrophones, these underwater microphones all across the oceans. And they were a little disappointed to hear sounds made by whales, different species of whales, different marine mammals. And they seem to be organized almost like some secret code. Actually for years they hoped it was some secret submarine code they were trying to figure out. And, uh, but it turned out the whales were making this sound and it wasn't until the end of the 1960s that they decided, okay, let's let people find out about this. We can release this to the world, to scientists. And these two young scientists, Roger Payne and Scott McVeigh, they listened to these sounds and transcribed them using devices called sonograms, sonographs, making these printouts. And on the cover of Science Journal this, in 1971, this beautiful abstract artistic image appeared. And even more remarkably, in the paper that they wrote together, they actually say something you rarely see or read in scientific papers. The humpback whale emits a series of surprisingly beautiful sounds. And they are incredibly beautiful. As Jenny rightly said, they did have a lot to do with getting people to care about saving the whales. Even more importantly, at the same time, they released this album, Songs of the Humpback Whale. And this is the cover, it's like the white album. And this is the best-selling nature recording of all time. Millions of copies have been spread into our culture and it's what got people to care about whale sounds inside very importantly, there was a 48 page book in English and Japanese about the fact that we were killing all these whales and we better do something or there wouldn't be any of these beautiful songs left. And although that's well known to us now at the time, environmentalists really didn't have whales on their radar or something they should care about. Uh, very impressed by these diagrams that uh, Payne and McVeigh made. I still, over the years was intrigued that people really couldn't hear this stuff as music and figure it out. And so I've experimented over the years of trying to make like scores of whale music, with colors and graphic elements. So you have here the whale song, Maui 2010. And it takes a while to get used to it, but you can see it and hear that there's a real music to this. We don't know what it says, we don't know what it means. Turning into a video becomes something you can kind of sing along with and play along. We want to show that this is kind of music, but an alien music. So it shouldn't have notes that were too much like human notes, but maybe it fits on the range of the musical staves, the treble and bass clefs. This project of visualizing whale songs that I did together with the designer, Michael Deal, eventually caught the attention of National Geographic, who years ago had printed a sound page, a little vinyl album of one whale song in 1979. They printed 10 million of these in all the editions of National Geographic around the world. It's still said to be the greatest single pressing of any record ever, 10 million all at once. And they started experimenting with making it look more like music. And they asked me to play along. final National Geographic thing kind of looked like this and then they really try and show you what's going on. Let's go back a little moment there. There. How to play a humpback melody. And you can go online and do this yourself. <laughs>
whole structure of this song is designed divided into themes A, B, C, D, E, F. appearance of this hybrid whale human musical notation maybe the only time musical notation has ever appeared in National Geographic in the more than 100 years of its existence 150 years perhaps and that's kind of remarkable that finally musical notation appears not for the music of humans but the music of animals this is in the latest issue of, of this magazine and they put it out together with a big tv series about whales and what's remarkable about this, this series is that it really emphasizes something that 10 years ago, hardly any scientist would agree with or say, the fact that whales have culture. They learn different things. They learn these songs. We don't know what they mean, but it's generally believed they're really like a kind of music, that the meaning of this thing happens by performing these things over and over and over again, rather than conveying specific information. They show the need of this animal to make music. So now I'm going to make some music with these sounds. And um, this part, you're just gonna be sharing the sound only. And so you're gonna hear my own straight and new for today piece made out of whale sounds and me playing the contrabass clarinet live. Let's see if that's gonna work. All right, here we go. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm kind of speechless there. <laughs> I don't really know what to say. I don't really know where I am right now. I think part of it's also that I haven't been to a concert or you know, seen a lot of live music in so long, but um, I don't want this program to end. <laughs> We made it work. All the parts fit together. Thank you for that. That was incredible. Um, now we do have a bit of time now. To, I think that, you know to talk, and um, I'm sure I, I have lots of questions. But I know Jenny, you have some questions too. So um, I'm going to let you kick it off. But um, you know, for those of you that are still with us as well, um, we will have time also to take some questions let's say in about 15, 20 minutes um, from, from you all as well here joining us. So um, let's talk a little bit and then we'll open it up for additional questions. Does that sound good? Sounds great to me. Wow, I'm gobsmacked and I have chills for both of those pieces. Um, again, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm so grateful that we are able to be, you know, in this, uh, space where we could be so wild and take all of these risks with you know not only making super fragile um, fossil played bells that sometimes are on a ship in the arctic and work with experimental composers to activate them and have live whale sound uh, that was just wonderful thank you um, so I'm going to just ask a couple of questions, um, but I really would welcome questions from the audience too. I'll just uh, warm us up. Um, and so uh, uh, let's see, I'll start, Lynn, since, you, since your piece was first, I'll start with that. Um, I know that you have worked with many diverse um, instruments in the past, and I'm using instruments in quotes because I'm not sure how you like to refer to them. Um, such as amplified bones and sodium halide lamps. And I guess I wondered if you could share a little bit of what it was like to create an original composition when the instrument itself was a sculpture, um, or if you want to just sort of like share a little context about those other um, works that you've created in the past. Sure. Um, so the larger body of work uh, that you're sort of addressing, um, I tend to work with objects um, when I approach a new object, so like the light bulb, so, so a sodium halide light bulb for, uh, are the same kind of light bulbs that they used to use in street lights, the orangey yellow ones that used to come on. And uh, working with those uh, really became a materialist object study. Like I look at the object, I figure out what it does, how it sounds, what its function is, and then move from there. Uh, uh, with bone, working with bone, um, that that's a whole, that's a huge conversation. I'd probably, I'd just say like, I like the sound, like. I like putting microphones on objects and listening to them and bone makes some really great sounds and there's a lot of reasons why I use them, uh, which is actually, you know, thinking about this idea of um, objects of things that have passed, objects of, um, of, of beings that have passed uh, is a really interesting and intriguing concept to think about how these objects actually resonate and make sound. Uh, so switching from a gear where I, I take an object and I figure out what it is and what it does and sort of go into that to go into a sculptural space is a little bit different and I've, I've played other sculptures before again from a more like uh, materialist perspective of like what can it what can it do 
Um, so it's it, for, for me, it's actually a very unusual thing to go in and be asked to play something that is closer to an instrument uh, than I normally play, um, <laughs> which is kind of an interesting position to be in. Uh, so, you know, working uh, with objects um, in this instance was really about working in space uh, and look, looking at these objects and where they're situated, looking at the room that they're in, thinking about how the sound travels in the room. So working with the bells um, for me really was more about like listening to them and hearing how the different kinds of ways to excite them either through the clapper or we wound up using the clapper and um, mallets, uh, foam, uh, yarn covered mallets or, or foam and, and fluffy material. I don't know what a timpani mallet's covered in, so I'm just gonna say fluffy material, uh, you know, to, to excite the, the object. Um, you know, we listening to the time became a big part of this, right? You have to listen to the bell, how it how the tone expands over time. Uh, so working with this particular sculpture really became about how fast can you make note? You, you have to think about like how long the sound takes to travel and decay, um, movement between to and from the bells, you know, working uh, working with two people, uh, you can only cover so much distance. And so it really was about thinking about time and space and just spending time in the space, right? Like, so when I work on a project like this, I need to spend probably three weeks with an object before I can start to really think about how to use it. Um, so it's been a lot of fun working with this piece. It's been really fun. And it's a real treat to go into a, to a gallery space once a week for over a month to just enjoy something alone was really fun. Um, I really appreciate it. I mean, I've listened to your piece a number of times at this point, but I really appreciate it listening to it after having just spoken about the bells and realizing just how much um, you really are tying into other aspects of the work. So obviously not only the ship's bell and the kind of aspect of timekeeping, which comes back as, uh, you know, I don't know if refrain is the appropriate word, but uh, repeated motif. And also I just kept feeling this like rocking motion kind of the rocking of a ship or the sort of like the layering of the various um, you know, harmonics and subharmonics and thinking about a pod of whales. So I just really appreciated all of those um, elements of the piece. And I think it flowed so beautifully into what David then brought to us. Um, so uh, I'll ask David a question. Um, firstly, like I didn't know at all what David was going to do. And I feel like my central nervous system is like melted into a little puddle on the floor in the absolute best of ways. So. Also, like Stephen, I feel desperately deprived of live music, and I just loved it. Um, so <laughs> I've known about your work making music with whales for years um, and was really happy that you agreed to be part of this. And especially because I felt it was important for the program to link to the kind of outside the museums to the whales themselves and bring in their actual voices, which, of course, are implied in um, the bells, but not actually um, given vocal space. And so you spoke about the um, really unique piece that you were actually recently invited to create for National Geographic. And I wondered how you had to change your traditional um, improvisatory style to work with uh, what National Geographic wanted. Well, thanks so much for inviting me, Jenny. And thanks, Andrew and Lynn, also for this beautiful work that you know took this notion of whales and, and conservation and, what? and uh, put it together in such an unusual way in such a beautiful and unique way. So I, I was honored to be invited to be a part of this. What's interesting is that when I wrote my book a long time ago, 2008, about whale song, I, since then, have been trying to get National Geographic to do something like this. And they would just ignore me and, and their eyes would glaze over if I met someone from there and talked to them. And then, then out of the blue, they just said, we want you to do this. I said, oh yeah? Well, do you know I've been asking you to do this for a while? Oh, we don't know about that, but this is what we want you to do. And uh, somebody, somebody listened to that uh, bass clarinet duet that I played a little bit of it for you. And they said, man, that, that whale sounds much more like a bass clarinet than you. And uh, <laughs> the reason was that I kept recording different versions of me doubling up with the whale exactly. And none of them were exact enough for them. I said, no, 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 you're changing a little bit. You have to be more exact. You have to be super exact. You have to be just exact the same, and that's gonna convince our readership these whales are making music. And I was saying, but but wouldn't it convince them if you could like go in between and kind of mess with them and kind of kind of go in between the whales like I would do playing live with them? They said, yeah, yeah, you could do that, but that's not what we want. So I did it like three times before they said, good, this is close enough. And so 
I think if, if you thought that the whale sound with their was not like less musical than you might be convinced by this. And so it was a real exercise to follow their instructions. And that's why when I played for you live today, it's like, I'm not gonna follow those instructions. I'm gonna go back to being inspired and transformed by the whales and see where the whales would take me. I think that that really sort of illuminates this interesting space that I'm hoping that this, this project is, is inhabiting to a certain degree that, you know, in between um, the artistic realms and the scientific realms. And I think we're falling like pretty hard in the artistic realm here, but extending tendrils in the other direction. Um, and I, I would be happy to open it up to other, um, other questions at this point. And I think Stephen, you're moderating if you care to take that on or. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, if, if there's any questions from the audience, certainly we have some time. Um, you know, you can either at this point turn on your video or turn on your uh, microphone and, and ask the question directly, or feel free to also uh, drop in the chat. We'll be monitoring that. I would have a question for David. When you were playing on the boat, did you feel that the whales were responding to you and that was, there was back and forth or were you doing a solo with their background? It's a great question. Most of the time you, they, you feel like they're not necessarily paying attention. And among biologists studying whale songs, they generally believe the whales are not paying attention to each other. The male whales are just doing these songs and that they just do them. They don't respond and interact with each other. But sometimes you hear something very different than that. And then you realize that, uh, well, these animals are known to change their songs and learn from different ideas so that they probably are listening and that we probably just don't really get what's going on that much. And so a little bit of the example I played with that first slide is this one moment where I go and the whale, instead of going starts to go and try and play a more continuous, make a more continuous sound. And that particular example, I played it for Jim Darling kind of expert on Hawaii's humpback whale songs. And he, he was fairly skeptical of my whole project, although he did let me go out on his boat and play with the whales. But when I played him that, he, he sort of said, what? Hmm, that was interesting. Something happened there that he didn't expect. So I could tell that this master of whale songs knew that the whale had done something that surprised him at that moment. That's great. I wanted to pick on there. There was a pick up a question that was asked really early on in the chat about um, the like the tuning of the bells, um, and I feel like uh, you know in a certain way it connects to what David's talking about in terms of the sort of um, hemming in or qu questions about like a sort of Western um, music being oriented around tones in a certain arrangement. Um, but just to also give some background about the glass, because I experimented a lot with the very subtleties of the shape and the thickness of the glass. And I had a, and my hypothesis was that if they were thicker, they would sound deeper. But in fact, that was very much not the case. And the thinner and bigger they were, the more resonant. Um, and uh, so the, the, the bells that are there <laughs> are, sort of all, all of all of the experiments, all the different things, but it was really lovely to see how Lynn um, sort of discovered the relationships that exist uh, with, within them in ways that, yeah, Jenny and I hadn't been able to explore, you know, activate all of them at once or with that kind of care. Um, so I think uh, those relationships were really surprising and exciting to hear. No, we were hanging like two or three at a time from the ductwork in your studio, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And eating ramen noodles with knitting needles when we were working for like a lot of hours <laughs> straight kidding. at that one point. <laughs> Didn't have any spoons. Uh, like artists do. Um, I guess maybe to bounce yeah. that question to Lynn, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. I mean, obviously you're not you approach lots of things that are not tuned in a traditional way, but. Yeah, I mean, so it became it, like from a compositional standpoint, it's an interesting thing. Um, uh, the way that I wrote the piece and the way that the piece is designed is that it is not written in a, p a pitch centric way. Um, I don't have any pictures to show you of the score uh, because it's all hand drawn and I haven't taken photographs of it yet. Um, 
the score uses a style of notation called graphic notation, which means that at very similar actually to um, my images look nothing like David's uh, David's images tonight, but in similar to sort of the notation around the the um, uh, the whales, you know, it's a, it's a picture that like evokes an, an action uh, from the performer, and uh, so the way that the piece is set up is so that the performer goes in and finds those relationships themselves before they play it. Um, what's interesting about the location, um, and one of the reasons why I, I kept shutting myself up earlier is because I can go on this for too long, so please shut me up at any point. Um, so what's really interesting about this location that this is in, so if any of you can get to the Broad to check this out, definitely do, um, and definitely make sure that you can get the, um, the, the gallery of uh, people to activate the bells so you can hear this, you can ask them to, to activate them for you. Um, what's really amazing is this particular room that they're currently settled in, uh, there are several of these frequencies will stack up and cause something called a resonant frequency in the room. So the room will actually sing the pitch for the bells, right? And so everything becomes extra loud and extra resonant. And it became a really interesting feature of working with this piece in that space. And that will happen to anyone who's performing the space wherever they do it, right? Because they're, whatever that room is, these bells will sound different in whatever location just based off of the physical properties of the room. Um, so this, you know, from, from my own perspective, that was an interesting uh, challenge within the piece. Um, I found that, you know, working with it, uh, the, the way that the instructions are is you find an, like it's to find an ostinato. So an ostinato is like a rhythmic pattern. You know, basically I'm saying make a groove, right? I'm not saying make a groove with these pitches, just make a groove that kind of has this shape of flow. So you're looking for high, low, middle, low, you know, just sort of like follow these shapes and that helped work it out. Um, so essentially anyone can play this piece as long as they just listen and take some time. Like you don't have to have any skill set uh, is the way that it's organized. I don't know if that helps approach some of these tuning questions. Um, the, the, one of the reasons why I'm just to sort of like get a little more detailed here, I don't think in pitches is because I tend to work with electronics. So my relationship to traditional notation is just off. It doesn't work anymore because I don't, I don't listen the same that I, that I used to. So it just hear, it, I hear it differently than I once would have. How is it different working with bells than with electronics? Um, with these bells, with these bells, it's not that different. What I, what I mean in, in hearing differently is like, like if I were to like try to put this on like notation paper, like I don't work on notation paper because I tend to like try to find like uh, microtones and I tend to work much more microtonally now than I would have before. And so for those of you who, who are not necessarily in, in, in the, the sound world, a microtone is like, if you hear a musical scale like do, re, mi, fa, sol and go up from there, uh, there, are, there are notes that can happen in between that. And that's sort of how I hear. And I don't understand like those, those intervals between those notes are too big for my ears now. And I, they don't make sense. So the bells are actually easier for me to work in because there's so many pitches that are so close together. Like there's points in the piece that we heard tonight where there's like two, two or three bells being rung at the same time. And all of a sudden it sounds like everything just went out of tune. It doesn't sound, they just kind of like warp. And so it was kind of exciting to work in that way. It makes me think about um, how whales are so large that they themselves almost become room spaces for, you know, by our scale and what, you know, what type of resonant frequencies may exist within the whale's bodies. So the whale song may sound actually quite different to the whale than it sounds to us, just as we all know that our own voice sounds different because we're perceiving a great deal of it, like sort of channeled through our mandibles. Um, it must be actually a different experience to be a whale rather than just to hear a whale. Yeah, I'm wondering, David, do you know, have they done any, mic like, done any, like, microphones on whales? Uh, yeah, they, they put, yes, they put D tags on whales, and, and so they can swim down, you can see where they go might record their motions. And they've recorded a lot of sound whales that are very hard to hear, like beaked whales that dive very, very deep. You know, you couldn't attach a hydrophone that that low, that that far down in the ocean. And so, so, so they've made all kinds of recordings. Think humpback whales, you don't need to do that for because they're, they're so loud. You can hear them pretty far away. But some of these other whales, this is the only way we've, we've learned about their, their sounds. And each species, of course, is a total world in itself. They do very, very different things. And even though as um, we know more about how the, the toothed whales make sounds because they're related to dolphins that have been in captivity, we don't really know how the humpback whales even make these sounds. 
because nobody's figured it out. They've taken their them them apart, you know. So you look inside. Maybe this is making sound. Maybe this we just don't know. Yeah, remarkable. It's pretty crazy mysteries. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, the, of the you know very different and very rhythmic. Uh, or percussive staccato sounds of sperm mm -hmm. whales. And um, I was going to ask David if you know much about this new initiative called Project SETI, which is not S-E-T-I, like people might be familiar with um, looking for intelligible speech from the stars, but C-E-T-I, like cetaceans, uh, finding our own intelligence. A little bit, I know a little bit about home. that. Yeah, which is also, it's um, AI, is that correct? That they're sort of- Yeah, the people in the, in the AI world believe if we crunch a lot of data, we feed all these whale sounds into our artificial intelligence, machine learning devices, they're gonna figure it out. We don't uh, have because, nearly enough data. Right, we don't have that much data. And also, you know, the, you know, the whole idea of machine learning is about not being smart, just, just the idea that starting with nothing you could, you could find patterns, you can find patterns, but still in most aspects of bioacoustics, people listening and changing the speed and looking at different speeds, you know, different, uh, changing the sound that's out of range of our hearing in, in pitch and time and making it more accessible. That's what's led us to figure out what they're doing. You shouldn't discount human listening abilities. And uh, some of the artificial intelligence approach, you know, is more like, a, like, dream like okay data will solve everything just feed it in the answers will come so i have a question about how listening to whales might change the way you listen to people and i'm curious if by listening to whales and sort of developing a an affinity with the incredible sound they're making if you find there's a transfer to noticing that somebody talking that seems like you know really common Absolutely. In this event, you know, we, we hear this, this uh, toddler somewhere in the background. It sounds like a whale. Okay, maybe I understand what she's saying because I can understand whales, maybe. And of uh, course, uh, you know, I remember my, my son learning to sound like a whale before he could talk, hearing these recordings and stuff. And uh, I think it certainly changes your sense of what music can be, how to, how to understand the structure of sounds. And you, you, you know, these whales, humpback whales make a kind of music. They follow these rules and they're different than human rules, but they're musical rules all the same. And when you start to spend time in this musical universe, you, you find a way to kind of fit into it. And you don't know what the whales are thinking of you, but you could definitely make a music that no one species could make alone. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like there are these different approaches, right? The sort of the intuitive versus the data-driven approach. And I don't know, when I said um, what I said in my short talk about that I hoped that during our lifetimes we would gain greater insight into what it is that the whales may be trying to communicate um, or that they are communicating. Um, I don't know, I really think, I, I really hope and believe that. So it'll be really interesting to see which, which methodology prevails or maybe somewhere in between the two of them? Yeah, I've always thought in the different projects I've done that, that you have to use all forms of human knowledge to approach something out there in nature. Like a musician might say this, a naturalist will say that, an artist will see this, you know, a biologist sees this, and they, they don't reduce to each other. You have to put them all together. And, and the, very, the interesting thing is that the different approaches say very different things. You have to acknowledge the value of these different sides. Like a human being can be a musician one moment, a statistician another moment, a dancer another, you know, like it's all things we can do. And what can whales do? We don't yet know. We don't know exactly what it feels like from the whale perspective, you know, and, but I think we can, we can get quite, much closer for the way animals experience things from using all these different methods. We really can learn a lot and, and imagine what it's like to be all these creatures. I don't want to hog the discourse, but I also thought it was really fascinating that the glass growing process could make a connection with the whale mm -hmm. sounds and, and Putting those two things together was really, really fascinating. Andrew, do you have anything you want to share about that? I know you were thinking about, you know, blowholes and 
holding one's breath and all kinds of other aspects while you were blowing the glass. Yeah, I mean, I think all those things are are there. I think also just like a transparent medium is such an unusual material. Most of the ways we encounter, you know, form and color is through kind of opaque surface things. And um, part of what makes water so strange and mysterious is this transparent medium that um, built up over volumes um, creates this other kind of space. Um, yeah, I wonder what actually looking at our bells underwater would be a totally different thing. I had a question for, for Andrew and Jenny about the knots. I was really interested in the book of knots and I, I wanted to know how the process worked for you of selecting which knots you used for the bells, if you used different ones or if you chose the same knot um, and, and how you came to that decision. You want to take that or no? Uh, we can both. Do you want to do you okay. have something? Yeah, so initially you saw that image of the um, Japanese glass buoy, which of course there's sort of, you know, an iconic thing that people are relatively familiar with and it uses a technique that is actually, it looks like knots, but it's actually referred to as knotless netting because of the method by which the um, ropes are sort of uh, entangled one with another. And that was initially our plan was to use that technique. Um, but of course we have these other really practical concerns about how to protect a fossil that's actually in some cases were quite, is it uh, like frangible, like really fragile. Um, and then they're knocking into a bell at variable speeds. Um, so we, we adapted from there and um, yeah, had a lot of fun with Andrew's amazing book. We used a couple other techniques in other places to sort of um, bind the um, bits of the rope back together again. So actually when you see them hanging from the ceiling in the gallery and heading all the way down to the tassel, it's actually one continuous piece of rope. So it's the rope is, it comes from the ceiling, it, it's been opened up, knotted around the fossil, and then re, you know, sort of like re-closes or recombines so that it is one continuous piece. Yeah, that was the insight I was going to add, that it's, it's one continuous material that's been, um, yeah, opened up and reconnected. Um, yeah, and, and part of, I think, what's beautiful about the material, like a twisted rope, all the strands are are in there um, and there is something I, I don't know I feel like there is something also about the relationship of the gradient in the glass that is about this sort of like stretching and opening up and then pulling back together that is echoed in in that treatment with the rope and actually if we want to talk rope we were really thrilled to be able to find a American manufacturer that makes this beautiful 100% cotton rope that's actually made with quite a bit of um, recycled content from the garment industry and they have these, you can go on their website, it's, they're called Raven Ox, like as in Raven and Ox, but together. Um, and they have these fabulous videos of rope making machines, I think some of which are quite old. And it's just a, you know, I mean, as an artist, you can't help but read this kind of metaphoric potential into it of like all the strands coming together to create this one stronger um, binding cord. It's really beautiful. Okay, we're at 830, but I, I want to ask one question. <laughs> and, um, you know, thinking about, I think both Jenny and David, you both mentioned kind of, you know, just look back to the 70s, this time that the whale song and these things were kind of first coming to light or, or, or you know, uh, to the ear and um, were kind of this galvanizing moment to bring attention to this issue and, and, and certainly had a strong effect in terms of thinking about protection and conservancy and things of that sort. So what does it mean to continue to be uh, collaborating whether in these interspecies ways or, or continuing to work with whale songs and, and thinking about these issues? What does that mean today? What do you hope that continuing this conversation, these collaborations um, with whales uh, puts out into the world. 
You want to respond first, David? Or? I would say that people still, you know, should pay more attention to nature. All, all kinds, what's nearby, what's far. We should take it more seriously and recognizing the beauty in what animals are doing and the music and the art that happens in the natural world brings us closer to taking nature seriously, which we need to do if we're not gonna destroy everything. It's not gonna, this is not gonna fix the problems of climate change or immediately, you know, have immediate pragmatic answers to all these crises we face now, but it, it's going to bring us just a little closer to, to appreciating the value in the natural world and just, just taking it all in as something beautiful and valuable. And it's just really interesting. You learn so much by, mm -hmm. by taking the sounds of nature more seriously. Yeah, I think that um, this, this idea of interspecies collaboration and hopefully moving one day towards interspecies communication is so compelling to me because it feels to me as though what has been lost as human beings have um, gone from living in the way that other animals live embedded in the sense-based natural world to living in society. I mean, it's, it's funny, like when we say the world, you know, what do we mean by the world? What, how limited or expansive of our view or is our view of that? And I think that, um, Honestly, in this day and age, um, when a lot of people feel apathetic, unhappy, restless, I, I believe that one of the things that we are suffering from collectively as a species is a form of ecological boredom. I actually think that we were not, we did not evolve to live in this world. We evolved to live in a world that was infinitely more rich and varied and unpredictable with many more things that were unknown to us, right? That we were in direct contact on a daily basis with unknowns and unknowables that were, you know, part of our experience as the voices of all of these other creatures that share the planet with us. And so I fear that we, you know, if we don't if we don't listen to those voices before we extinguish them, we will be living on a lonely planet. We, um, the idea to me that, you know, that we might miss out on that chance is a very sad one. And I think that, um, you know, I, I, I think that I can at least speak for myself in the work that I am interested in doing is yes, getting people to listen a little more closely um, so that we can value these others. It is not just, it is not just the human on this world that makes um, life worth living. Well, thank you both for that. And I, I think that's a nice, uh, uh, a haunting, but you know, also I think important note perhaps to end on because I, I also wanna thank you all, uh, Jenny and Andrew, Lynn and David. I, I mean, your work brings awareness, but it also brings beauty into the world uh, to draw our attention and, and asking us to also hear these things. And so I want to say thank you for that. And I think with that, um, I also say, say again, thank you to everyone that joined us this evening. Um, also to my colleague, Aaron Word, who I failed to mention earlier for his help and, and certainly deft handling of the production of the video with Lynn. Um, yeah, and to all my colleagues at the museum for making the exhibition and this program tonight possible. Um, yeah, I'm totally grateful. So thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful Thanks. weekend and Thanks. let's do this again. Thank you <laughs> Thanks. Take it on the road. That's right. <laughs> all right. I'm there. Okay. okay. See you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone.